Well, our scripture reading this evening then is from Ezekiel chapter 2 and verse 8 to Ezekiel chapter 3 and verse 15. So let us hear the word of God. Ezekiel 2 and verse 8. But you, son of man, hear what I say to you. Be not rebellious like that rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. And when I looked, behold, a hand was stretched out to me, and behold, a scroll of a book was in it. And he spread it before me, and it had writing on the front and on the back, and there were written on it words of lamentation and mourning and woe. And he said to me, Son of man, eat whatever you find here. Eat this scroll and go speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he gave me this scroll to eat. And he said to me, Son of man, feed your belly with this scroll that I give you and fill your stomach with it. Then I ate it. And it was in my mouth as sweet as honey. And he said to me, Son of man, go to the house of Israel and speak with my words to them. For you are not sent to a people of foreign speech and a hard language, but to the house of Israel. Not to many peoples of foreign speech and a hard language whose words you cannot understand. Surely if I sent you to such, they would listen to you. But the house of Israel will not be willing to listen to you. For they are not willing to listen to me. Because all the house of Israel have a hard forehead and a stubborn heart. Behold, I have made your faces hard as their faces. And your forehead as hard as their foreheads. Like emery harder than flint have I made your forehead. Fear them not, nor be dismayed at their looks. For they are a rebellious house. Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, all my words that I shall speak to you, receive in your heart and hear with your ears. And go to the exiles, to your people, and speak to them and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, whether they hear or refuse to hear. Then the Spirit lifted me up, and I heard behind me the voice of a great earthquake. Blessed be the glory of the Lord from its place. It was the sound of the wings of the living creatures as they touched one another, and the sound of the wheels beside them, and the sound of a great earthquake. And the Spirit lifted me up and took me away. And I went in bitterness and the heat of my spirit, the hand of the Lord being strong upon me. And I came to the exiles in Tel Aviv, who were dwelling by the Kibar Canal. And I sat where they were dwelling. And I sat there, overwhelmed among them, seven days. And we close there our reading from the ESV in verse 15. And we do trust the living God will bless this reading from his word. Well, you will remember in our last study, we looked for a short time at the preaching of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. And how when he preached, There were those like perhaps Simon and Peter and the other disciples who who listened to him, who followed him. Others like Nicodemus, who because of his preaching sought him out and wanted to understand how they might be born again. But we also discovered, didn't we, there were other people like the scribes and the Pharisees and the hypocrites. And they did not like the preaching of our Lord and Saviour. And then we discovered further, there were even many of the disciples who when they began to understand the teaching and the doctrine of Christ, they no longer wanted to follow him. But what did Jesus do? As was expected of God's servant, Ezekiel. Jesus preached the truth. No matter what the reaction, no matter whether people liked him, couldn't stand him, loathed him, hated him, or loved him. 
He preached the truth. Because we read in Mark's Gospel, that was what he came to do. But we move on this evening. And thinking again about our Saviour, we understand before he came and before he preached, being the eternal Son of the eternal God, he wasn't at all surprised by the reaction to what he said, by the reaction to what he preached. He knew in advance that he would be despised. He knew in advance that he would be rejected by men. And yet with all he came and he preached to the honour and to the glory of God. But as we continue this evening then in our studies in Ezekiel, the strange thing is this man Ezekiel, he also knew what the reaction would be to the call that God gave to him. Even as the Lord Jesus Christ knew that there would be those who would despise his words and despise him. So Ezekiel, as he receives the call of God, is told the very same. In advance, God warns, or God tells Ezekiel a number of things. First of all, he tells them there in Ezekiel chapter 3 and verse 7. He tells Ezekiel, listen, the people to whom you are going to preach, they will not listen to you. Makes it clear, makes it plain, you are going out, you have received this call from me. And the people to whom you are going to preach, and the people to whom you must preach, no matter what their reaction, they will not be willing to listen to you. And he tells them why they're in the same verse. But the house of Israel, verse 7, will not be willing to listen to you, for they are not willing to listen to me. They're not going to listen to you, because they won't even listen to me. The great God of the heavens and the earth. And why does God tell Ezekiel this? Well surely in the first instance he does so. To forewarn his prophet of what is ahead of him. But he is also surely seeking to get across to Ezekiel. That when this happens. He is not to take it. What we might say personally. He is to try not to take this to heart. Because in point of fact they are rejecting and they will not listen to him. Because he is saying what God wants to be said. They are not going to listen to him. But he isn't to take it too personally. Because they don't listen to God either. And funny enough, in Carnlough on Sunday night, I was thinking on this as well as we looked at Romans chapter 8 and my thoughts went to Acts chapter 9 and verse 1 where we read, But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any belonging, that is, any Christians, any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And then we read, Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? But you see what's being said there. Saul was going to Damascus to seek Christians out and to bring them bound back to Jerusalem and to punish them. So far as Saul is concerned, all he is doing is attacking individual Christians 
and attacking the church of Christ. That's what he thinks. But that's not how the Lord sees it. For he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul and persecuting the Christians was actually persecuting the Saviour. And when these people in Ezekiel's day were, were rejecting or would reject the word that Ezekiel was going to preach, they weren't simply, indeed they weren't merely rejecting Ezekiel, but they were rejecting the Lord himself. And so as Ezekiel takes up the call, when this happens, He's to see it as it is. And he's not to take it too personally. But then, secondly, they won't listen because these people, these Israelites, have hard foreheads and stubborn hearts. What do we read again in verse 7? Because all the house of Israel have a hard forehead and a stubborn heart. I don't know about you, but some of you I know have an interest in history as I do. But last summer I was called upon to take a funeral of someone just outside of the village of Ahokal. And they had different children who lived in different corners of the world. And one of the sons, he lived in Arizona. And at the wake we began to talk. And he began to tell me that where he lived in Arizona, you could trace almost the path that the Scots Aris or the Ulster Scots made from where we would call today the East Coast to Arizona. You could trace our names. For instance, my name, McGacky, is MCG. And he was telling me his name was MC. A, I think. And throughout Arizona, and then into Texas, and then back over the Appalachian Mountains. Throughout that whole area, you could trace the people that came from this part of the world. And why were we there? Well, historically, there are different reasons. But when our ancestors landed in the New World, the English colonists looked upon themselves as civilised. And the German colonists looked upon themselves as civilized. And they looked to our ancestors to be the Indian fighters. To be the buffer zone between the Indians and between the English colonists and the German colonists. And they brought us there and they wanted us there and they kept us there. Because historically... We were a very stubborn people. That's how it is when you look back. We were able to stand and to survive where different people groups were not able to survive. And our ancestors had such an important role to play in the establishment of the United States of America. So stubbornness at times can be a very useful quality. But stubbornness, spiritually speaking, is a damning attitude in the church of Christ and in the hearts of people. It's one thing being stubborn in this world, stubborn about maybe doing some job that nobody else wants to do, but we stick at it and we get it done. But sadly, because of the influence of sin and the impact of sin very often people are stubborn to the things of God they want to do their own thing they want to go their own way they do not want to hear what God is saying and they do not want to do what God is telling them to do and so it was here in Israel and God is telling his servant Ezekiel that these people have hard foreheads and stubborn hearts so they won't listen to Ezekiel because they won't listen to God 
They won't listen to Ezekiel because of hard foreheads and stubborn hearts. And then also they won't listen to Ezekiel because at heart these people are rebels. Ezekiel chapter 2 and verse 3. And he said to me, Son of man, I send you to the people of Israel, to a nation of rebels who have rebelled against me. And then verse 9 of chapter 3. Like emery harder than flint have I made your forehead. That's what God says he has done to his servant. He has made his forehead so hard. Fear them not, nor be dismayed at their looks. For they are a rebellious house. You know, in the New Testament, one of the worst things that can be said about an individual is that that individual is a hypocrite. It's one of those terms one of those descriptions that is so dark and is so low. But sometimes, surely, when we come to the Old Testament and we read the Old Testament, this thought of rebellion is little different to the thought of hypocrisy. Indeed, so much so does the Lord God despise a rebellious heart. That you will remember in one instance he likens rebellion to the sin of witchcraft. The children of Israel, rebels by nature and rebels by practice, had a big problem with authority. And so they would not be too keen to hear the words of Ezekiel. So in advance, God tells Ezekiel how people will respond to the message that he is going to bring and why they will respond. And what we then move on to to ask is simply this. What is the response of Ezekiel to what he hears? What is the response of Ezekiel to this call that God has given to him, to this hard, to this difficult, to this trying, heartbreaking call. Well, we read of his response there in verse 14 of chapter 3. The Spirit lifted me up and took me away, and I went in bitterness in the heat of my spirit, the hand of the Lord being strong. Upon me. I don't know when you hear that tonight. Does that surprise you? Does that shock you? Here is a, a servant of the living God. One who has been given a very distinct and clear call from God. He has been told what he must preach. He has been told the reaction to this preaching and we might stand back tonight and we might expect being a servant of God he will be willing he will be keen he will be enthusiastic to grasp this challenge and to enter the fray that's what you and I might expect that's what you and I might anticipate but there we read in verse 14 the Spirit lifted me up and took me away, and I went in bitterness and the heat of my spirit, and the hand of the Lord being strong upon me. So to begin with, he is bitter, and he is angry at this call that God has given to him. And the, the old Baptist commentator John Gill says this, his spirit was hot and angry. He was froward and unwilling to go on the errand to prophesy sad and dismal things to the people. And we might be critical of the man, mightn't we? But put yourself in his shoes for a minute. Maybe you're interested in a sport. Perhaps football. And the coach gets you 
For the manager gets you before the game and they sit you down and they tell you, listen, you're going to get hammered. Not only are you going to get hammered, you're going to get humiliated. You're going to play with all your heart. You're going to give it the best that you can give it. But despite all of this, you are going to lose and you're going to be embarrassed. In a sense, that's what Ezekiel here is being told. You obey my call. You give the message that I am giving you to preach. You preach your heart out. And it will all be thrown back in your face. In a sense it's no wonder. The man is angry. And bitter. And it's made all all the worse, isn't it? Because it seems from what we read here that Ezekiel is being given no choice. What does he say there at the end of verse 14? The Spirit lifted me up and took me away and I went in bitterness and the heat of my spirit. The hand of the Lord being strong upon me. He doesn't want to preach this. He doesn't want to leave the presence of the Lord and do what the Lord is telling him to do. But the hand of the Lord is strong upon him. And he must go. And he will go. Whether he wants to or not. You know, some Christians today, I think, are a wee bit confused about these things. It's as if maybe this chapter was never written. It's almost as if the book of Jonah was never written. Remember the call that God gave to Jonah. Remember how he told him that he must go to the great city of Nineveh and there he must preach the truth. What happens? Jonah doesn't want to go. Jonah is very much like Ezekiel here. He doesn't want to go and he doesn't want to preach this message of repentance. And what does he do? We know he goes down to Tarshish and he gets onto a boat and he heads the opposite way as far away as he can get from Nineveh because he does not want to go where God is sending him and he does not want to preach what God is telling him to preach. We all know what happens. God intervenes, doesn't he? A great storm comes upon the sea. The the godless, superstitious fishermen, they realize there is something amiss and, and Jonah ends up being thrown out and the whale comes or the great fish comes and takes him away and Jonah ends up where God decreed. Remember we were thinking about that on the Lord's day, the decrees of God. God had decreed that Jonah would be in Nineveh. And should it take a storm? Should it take a great fish? Jonah will be in Nineveh. And Jonah preaches the message that God has given to him. And the people in Nineveh repent. And what do we read at the very end of Jonah in Jonah chapter 4? And at the very end, verse 8, When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die, and he said, It is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, Yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. He's angry, isn't he, as Jonah? Uh, And the Lord said, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 
120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also much cattle. Jonah preaches what God told him to preach. The people respond positively and God's servant is angry. Because it would seem he had no love for the people of Nineveh. He's angry. He's bitter. Not only this, but God's servant Ezekiel is overwhelmed at what his demanded of him. What do we read in verse 15? And he came to the exiles at Tel Aviv who were dwelling by the Kibar Canal and I sat where they were dwelling and I sat there overwhelmed among them seven Days. The Septuagint translation suggests that they sat here for seven days and, and chatted and talked with the exiles who were found along this canal. But the Targum, one of the ancient Jewish commentaries, suggests the exact opposite that so overwhelmed is Ezekiel that he sits in silence. For seven days. And that is how our Bibles translate this portion of the scripture. And when you think on that. Overwhelmed sitting in silence. For seven days. Sure we are of other examples in the scriptures. Job chapter 2. Job chapter 2 and verses 11 to 13. Now when Job's three friends heard all this evil that had come upon him, they came each from his own place, Eliphaz, the Temanite, Bildad, the Shuhite, Zophar, the Namathite. They made an appointment together to come to show him sympathy and comfort him. And when they saw him from a distance, they did not recognize him. And they raised their voices and wept. And they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads towards heaven. And listen, and they sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights. And no one spoke a word to him. For they saw his suffering. That is, the suffering of Job was very great. These three friends, they, they have come to try to help and to try to encourage Job, their friend. When they see him from a distance, they don't even recognize him. Such is the state that he is now in. But when they come a bit closer and they understand that this is their friend, their good friend Job, they can't take it in. They're overwhelmed. And for seven days. And for seven nights. They sit. In silence. I don't know if any of you have ever been. Overwhelmed. In a sense. Like that. But as an assistant minister in West and North Belfast at times, you had to make some hard and from difficult calls and visits. And I don't go into any details this evening, but there had been an atrocity just around the corner from where we live. And I knew one of the young people who had lost their lives in that atrocity. And her family and her friends would have, especially her cousins and that, would have gone to our youth club and our boys' brigade and our girls' brigade and things like that. And, and though I didn't want to go round and, and see the family, I still remember going out of my house and de heading down towards Agnes Street to where that house was. Entered that house as a minister of the gospel. There was just silence. Silence. When out of the house, having paid my respects, and a young man I knew from our boys' brigade was sitting on the windowsill on down the street, just sitting with his hand, head in his hands. 
and shocked, overwhelmed at what had happened, that his little cousin was lying dead in that house. I didn't say anything to him, but we sat together in that window cell for maybe an hour or more. But it was all too much. The grief was too raw. The, the following Lord's Day, the bomb had gone off on the Saturday. That Lord's Day morning, the congregation where I was preaching was in shock as well. And we couldn't even have a children's dress. Nothing that you could maybe laugh at or be happy at. Because the whole community was overwhelmed with the sadness of what had happened. So it is with Ezekiel here. He has been told he must preach. He has been told what he must preach. He is bitter and he is angry for not only must he preach this, but he knows that people will not listen. And whether the trendy modern church accepts it or not, he has no choice in the matter because the hand of the Lord is heavy upon him. It is no wonder, surely then, that for seven days he sits overwhelmed by it all. And it's only when we look at this, when we consider this, that we understand how difficult and how hard God's call to Ezekiel, to the valley of the dry bones, must have been. When God once again takes his servant in the spirit. This time to a valley of dry bones, making it clear, abundantly clear, that these bones are dead and there is no life in them and they represent the entire house of Israel. A feeling of deja vu. For Ezekiel, here we go again. Not an easy call, but Ezekiel is God's servant, and Ezekiel must obey what God has decreed. Let us pray. Our gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, so often when we read your word, we see things that we didn't see before. And as we read your word this evening and think upon your word this evening, we understand better now why this call to Ezekiel in Ezekiel chapter 37 to the valley of the dry bones must have been so hard and must have been so difficult for Ezekiel, your servant, to take up. But we thank you, our God, in your will and in your purpose. You are with your servant. You are with your prophet. You are with your preacher, and enabled by your grace, he was enabled to preach the truth. And our Father at that time, you chose to bless the preaching of your word. We look at this, we think on this, we consider this, and we understand how important it is in our day in our congregation, in our individual 
reply. No matter what the reaction, no matter what people think of what we believe, what we preach, what we testify to, it is so important. Though it may be hard and though it may be difficult, though some might laugh, though some might make fun, it is so important that we follow the example of your servant, Ezekiel, but primarily that we follow the example of your servant and our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. We preach the truth, come what may, because that was what he had come to do. That was what you sent him to do. And so he was obedient to the call that you had given to him. May we be so in our day. And might you bless us as individuals. And might you bless our congregation both today and tomorrow and in the days ahead. And now we thank you this evening for your presence with us. And pray as we leave this place and go our separate ways, you would go with us and you would grant us journeying mercies. For it's in the Saviour's name we pray. Amen.